All right, let's start letting people in. Right, we have 170, here they come. Here they come, look at those names pouring in. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I'll, I'll introduce myself a couple of times. For those of you who are already in the room, it looks like there's at least 50 of you now. I'm Dr. Ted Barnett, the high-tech doctor with low-tech solutions. Some of you know me as Dr. Veggie. I am the founder of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute and Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Group. We started back in 2015. And uh, let's see, how do we look? Looks like uh, we probably have most of the people in the room now. All right, it's 7.02. No, they're still coming in. I'll just wait another minute or so. <clears throat> so, looks like people are sending messages. Nice. Yeah, Linda Healer, it's nice to see you as well. Thanks for coming. So, um, <clears throat> we're going to have a QA. and a um, section as well as um, a chat. If you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A. Somebody's saying, I can't see anything here. Well, hopefully we can get that fixed. Somebody says, hi from Rochester, Minnesota. Great, yeah, let us know where you're from. All right, I think it's uh, time for me to give the official introduction. Um, <clears throat> hi there, I am Dr. Ted Barnett, otherwise known as Dr. Veggie, the high-tech doctor with low-tech solutions. Um, I am the uh, president of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute, and welcome to, what month is this? The June meeting, or the June uh, uh, Lifestyle as Medicine lecture. And we're very excited tonight to have Dr. Carla Hightower from Chicago. And uh, before we introduce her though, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Dr. Susan Friedman, who's a professor of medicine at the uh, University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. And uh, she's been with us since the beginning. Uh, and I'm so proud to have her uh, have her here. Dr. Friedman, um, as I said, hello, Dr. Friedman. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, she's a professor of medicine at the University of Rochester. She's also a world-renowned geriatrician and uh, the lead author on the American Geriatric Society white paper on healthy aging. So if you want to uh, be someone who ages healthfully, you should listen to what Dr. Friedman has to say. She's an expert on that. And um, in fact, this morning, we were just out strolling through Menden Ponds Park looking for birds, and uh, both of us got a little bit of sun. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Vitamin so, uh, D the natural way. <laughs> exactly. We got it the natural way. So Dr. Friedman, welcome. And uh, tell us about our, uh, a little, if you have any messages about yourself, and tell us about our guests, please. Um, no particular messages about myself. Um, okay. Thanks for the introduction. Sure. Um, I'm so I, I'm very pleased to um, introduce Dr. Hightower. Um, Dr. Hightower is a physician and was a practicing anesthesiologist for 21 years before changing gears after uh, she observed that unhealthy food was responsible for most of the preventable chronic diseases affecting her patients. And after overcoming her own medical conditions, which um, she's going to be uh, talking about um, and which she has addressed through plant-based nutrition and lifestyle changes. Um, Dr. Hightower graduated from the honors program in medical education at Northwestern. And uh, we were in the program together and uh, first met about almost 40 years ago now. It's hard to, hard to believe. Um, and she also received an MBA at Northwestern's uh, Kellogg School of Management. She's a board certified anesthesiologist and she has worked in Indiana, Ohio, where she was chair, the chair of anesthesia um, at Good Samaritan Hospital and in Illinois. Um, in 2015, she completed a certificate in plant-based nutrition at the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies. And in 2018, uh, completed uh, integrated health coach certi certification uh, at the Duke Integrative Medicine Program. Uh, she's currently working as a certified integrative health coach, wellness consultant, and the founder of Living Health Works. Um, in this capacity, she provides wellness workshops and online courses to teach adults how to create 
healthy lifestyles with plant-based nutrition so that they can heal themselves, have more energy and lead productive lives. So very, very happy that uh, Dr. Hightower could be with us tonight. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's my honor to be here for this presentation. And I'm so happy about this topic to teach you tonight about food cravings. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Great, and Dr. Freeman and I are gonna disappear. So you're in good hands. You have Dr. Hightower taking care of you now. Excellent, wonderful. I'll give you a brief story before we get into the, the food cravings, I want to share with you a story. When I was, as, as Dr. Friedman explained to you, we went to medical school at Northwestern together. And this is a picture of me graduating in 1987. It was a very traditional medical edu education that we received. And it was an excellent experience. It really was. We received the skill sets through our program to have strong diagnostic skills, to use pharmaceutical drugs and surgeries, to take care of patients, and certainly be excellent clinicians. I chose my specialty of anesthesiology, and I practiced for 21 years, focusing on patients who, for the most part, were there for a life-saving procedure, like open heart surgery, we did labor and delivery, orthopedic procedures. We had trauma at the hospitals where I worked. So all of these procedures were extremely valuable. And I felt privileged to be able to care for patients in a way that I knew was making a difference. While I was good at taking care of my patients, however, I was not very good at taking care of myself. Between cases in the doctor's lounge, I had the cookies and the donuts. Sometimes we had pizza on Friday. If we did a lot of open hearts that week, you, can, you better bet that the cardiac surgeons were gonna order pizza. So that was my lifestyle. And I thought actually that I could get away with it because I worked out. I worked out a lot. And I thought I was getting away with it, but it turned out I wasn't. After years and years, in fact, in the peak of my career, when I was chairman of the department, I realized that I was sick, just like my patients. I started to have the experience of what it was like to become chronically ill. I had symptoms of exhaustion, abdominal pain every time I ate, severe acid reflux. I was taking the maximum amount of medications for that. I had chronic back pain, so I was seeing different doctors and taking anti-inflammatory medication. My joints were inflamed, chest pain, so I had a cardiologist to get worked up. I had CT scans for the abdominal pain, numerous ultrasounds, lots of blood tests looking for, the, looking for the evasive diagnosis. And one day I was diagnosed, I came down with a fever of 105, I was diagnosed with pneumonia and it turned out to be a resistant case. I was actually sick for six months. And that's when I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes. To be honest with you, these two things together, that became my red flag, my wake up call. Even though for years I had been sick, it took me actually getting pre-diabetes to wake me up and realized I needed to do something different. My daughter was only 12 years old. And I said, well, doggone, I am not gonna go down like this because I'd seen the open heart patients and the patients receiving amputations. I was in the operating room with them and I knew diabetes is, can be, that, that, can, that can, can beat you. So I had to do something different. And that led me to the whole food plant-based diet, which for me, it was truly life-changing to reverse all these symptoms, immediately I, I felt better. My exhaustion resolved, abdominal pain, acid reflux all gone. My joints no longer were swollen and inflamed. No more back pain, no need for pain meds. And I stopped coughing after I'd been coughing for six months. And of course my A1C returned to normal. So I was hooked on it. And over time, 
I wanted to, to do something now that truly could help people. And that eventually led me to my second career, which I'm in now as a health coach, focusing on wellness. Today, I have three objectives that I'm going to share with you in this presentation. The first is we are going to have a discussion about the root cause of junk food cravings. And then second, we're going to talk about why we choose self-destructive behaviors despite knowing they're unhealthy. And also I will share with you strategies to help you conquer those food cravings with a plant-based diet without having to rely on willpower. The presentation is for educational and informational purposes. It's not medical advice or nutritional counseling and the information does not diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any physical or mental disease. And remember modifications in diet and exercise and lifestyle may alter your health, including significant decreases in blood glucose and blood pressure. So you should consult with your doctor before changing your diet or lifestyle habits. So here is a question for you. If I gave you a choice between an apple or the chocolate chip cookies, which would you prefer? Just, you know, let's be honest. The, the cookies are what most people would choose, the cookies. And we would choose the cookies despite knowing that the apple is really the healthy choice. To really understand why this is the case, we need to look at these two types of foods. We're gonna talk about why we prefer cookies. Now, the thing about it is that science shows us that this preference for the higher calorie choice is our nature. We as humans, when given a, a choice, will choose the highest calorie option in our environment. It's a natural instinct. It is not something wrong with you. It's not because you aren't disciplined. It's not because you don't have great willpower, but it's because this is our natural design. When we eat high calorie foods, our brain sec secretes chemicals. Dopamine is the reward. It's a pleasure chemical. So when we eat the cookies, our brain secretes more dopamine than when we had the apple. And it's as simple as that. We are wired to move in the direction of pleasure. So what feels good is what drives us. This preference for the pleasurable option, which in this case is the high calorie option, most likely helped our ancestors survive in an environment where food was limited or erratic. So for them, it was a good thing. And I'm going to have, have a discussion now to break down more of the differences between that apple, the whole food, versus the cookies, the junk food. Let's take the apple first. So we're gonna do a deep dive into the characteristics of apples, whole foods, whole, whole plant-based foods in general. Number one is that a, the whole plant-based foods are packed with fiber, water, and nutrients. We have, we have the volume in an apple, even though, and it's low calorie, but it's, it's packed with vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. These are naturally low calorie foods and they're naturally low in fat for the most part. There's some exceptions like nuts and avocados and seeds, but for the most part, we're talking about low fat, low calorie foods. What happens when we're eating these whole plant-based foods is that we don't have to count calories. It's rare to have a craving for apples but that you won't find very many people, except for some rare exceptions, who have true food cravings when we're talking about plant-based options like these in this image here. And this is good because our brain is able to naturally gauge when we've had enough. We don't have to count points. 
We don't have to deprive ourselves or really control the portions. It just is part of our nature. However, the junk food is completely the opposite. And here are the characteristics of the junk food. And this explains why we crave the processed junk foods. Processed junk foods are artificial foods where the ingredients are very concentrated. The nutrients have been stripped, the fiber has been stripped away, and the water has been stripped away. So in other words, the food is shrunk. And then we add sugar, oil, and salt. These are three key ingredients that make processed junk food addictive, sugar, oil, and salt. So remember those because sugar, oil, and salt are not found in combination together in nature. This is a, a man-made artificial concept and it makes these foods exceedingly pleasurable and therefore addictive. The calories are very concentrated. So you can have more calories and more flavor per bite, but not feel full. Now we have really the deadly combination because these are addictive and they're unsatisfying. And our brain has no ability to gauge when we've had enough. So we continue to eat and to want more and more. In a natural environment, animals, creatures, or even if we lived in a natural environment, we would be dependent on whole natural foods that, we, that were available in that natural setting. And in that case, the, the natural drive that we have to seek pleasure would work out very well. By seeking pleasure, it's really a reliable compass because the things that give the most pleasure in that scenario are the things that are, are good for the animal. And there, here are two examples, food, which is for survival and sex, which is, is for reproduction. So all really that the species needs to do is just follow the drive of what feels the most pleasurable in their environment. And they're on the right track for the survival of the species. In other words, whatever feels good to them is good for them. But now let's take humans. In our world, we live in a modern world. It's artificial. We have artificial foods available to us. We also have, we have alcohol, tobacco, street drugs, things that aren't found in nature, but that are created by human beings for more pleasure. And these constructs are giving us an extremely high level of pleasure, an excessive le level of pleasure that actually leads us to poor outcomes. And the problem is that our, our natural wiring is still the same. We are still wired for choosing whatever gives us the most pleasure in our environment as our first choice, just like the cookie versus the apple. Well, now we have we have junk food and, and more things in that category to contend with. And this is really explaining our self-destructive behaviors because although we know at some point that these options are not healthy for us, our nature is still intact and our nature tells us to keep going for it. And the commercial food industry is exploiting this, this, this natural design. What in our case, what feels good for us is actually bad for us. And I'd like to give you some more clarity on food cravings by describing a concept called the dietary pleasure trap. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is a concept, the dietary pleasure trap, which comes from doctors Lyle and Goldhammer. They wrote about this in their book in 2003 called The Pleasure Trap. And this is taken from their research. Now, just to give you some clarity, I'm gonna explain that the x-axis here, these are the foods that an individual, a human being 
can eat. We have a healthy whole natural plant food, and then we've got junk food. And along the y-axis, we have pleasure. So just imagine right here, it's, and we, we have low, normal, and high for the pleasure as we move up. So let's talk about phase one. I'm gonna walk you through five phases. The first one is phase one. So just imagine that you have, let's say a young, a young toddler whose parents have been conscientious about giving them plant-based foods their whole life. And they've, they've never seen a cupcake. They've never seen the cookies, but they, they are eating their natural foods. And many times, and I certainly know in my case, my daughter had carrots and peas when she was, when she was first eating at nine months old and her diet was so healthy. And it was just something you do as a parent, right? Well, when individuals are eating that whole natural plant-based food, it tastes good to them. And that's what we have here. I remember my daughter's first word, when she was, she was less than a year old and she was sitting in her high chair and she said, mmm, apples. I was ecstatic that that was her first word because to her, eating a healthy apple was good. She got a normal amount of pleasure. But then we move into phase two. Now this is when, oh, the kid is in preschool and somebody has a birthday and they start eating cupcakes every week somebody has a birthday and when when there's a holiday the teachers bring in cookies right and then they're kind of indoctrinated into well they're old enough now they might as well go to mcdonald's and have their 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 kid meal right and the french fries well the difference is these foods give an exceedingly high level of pleasure the brain secretes more dopamine than down here eating a plant-based meal. So naturally we create a habit. We want more and more. Now that habit becomes consistent, very a, a routine to eat junk food. And this goes on into the teenage years, the college years and so forth. But the thing about it is that this pleasure doesn't last for long. Our taste buds and our brain adapt to it. We get used to it, which takes us to phase three. After eating junk food for a while, it tastes normal. It is the normal routine for the individual. It doesn't give them euphoria anymore. It's just what they're used to. And we call that tolerance right here in the phase three. And now through time, as they feel unhealthy and they realize that junk food is unhealthy, what they're going to do is try to get off of it. They're going to realize that they cannot live like this anymore. So they'll try to adapt and go back to eating healthy food. As they move to phase four, this is what we call the pleasure trap because their healthy food no longer tastes good. Their healthy food tastes bland. It tastes bad. There's very little pleasure in it. So what do they do? They go back to phase three, eating the junk food. And they'll spend this time toggling back and forth, going on and off of a healthy diet and never being able to really be free of their junk food addiction. And this is a pleasure trap. It's called that because what's bad for you feels good and what's good for you feels bad. It's just the opposite of the way that nature designed us to, to, to respond. So the secret is we have to be able to have the patience and the discipline really and consistency to stick with it. Once we stick with our whole plant-based diet, well, you'll see the taste buds start to wake up. Those desensitized taste buds come back to the ability to taste food again. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains start to be appealing. And over time, an individual can get themselves back here, which is phase five, which is success, where they've gotten through the pleasure trap and they're now able to eat whole plant-based foods again and enjoy it.
I'd also like to share with you these two concepts of distinguishing physical hunger versus food cravings. These are very different. Let's take physical hunger first. Physical hunger is a natural response when you haven't had food for a while. It can feel like discomfort in the stomach or even an actual pain, and it comes on gradually and slowly. It'll occur several, after, several hours after a meal, and it resolves upon eating. So upon eating a meal, the individual is going to feel satisfied and this physical hunger will, will dissipate and go away. The trigger for it is not eating, having an empty stomach. On the other hand, food cravings are very different. With food cravings, there's more of a, a mental urge. It's an intense desire. It's, it's not so much of a physical scenario as it is more of a of, a, of, a, of, a, of something in the, the brain, our, our mental urge is what's driving us. And it can come on fast. There's an impulsiveness to it. This is more likely to occur late. So as we get into the afternoon and the evening and the nighttime, so those night owls that stay up will tend to have more food cravings. And this can even occur and commonly occurs even when we're full. The, the feeling of eating the, whatever we're craving doesn't make us feel more satisfied. It makes us feel bad. We feel guilty, even ashamed. So this is a more negative outcome. And there's several triggers for this. It might just be the smell or the sight of, the of, of one of your foods that you crave, perhaps stress, even boredom, anxiety in certain activities. You may even find that when you're in a, familiar, a place that has a memory attached to it or, or it's a time for a holiday that it can trigger a certain craving. And certainly advertisements that you see on TV can really get you. Well, now I'd like to give you some strategies for conquering your food cravings without having to use willpower. And these are, I've categorized this, these strategies into four categories. The first category is the mindset shifts. Second is satisfying snacks. Third is meal and snack planning mastery. And fourth are your lifestyle refreshers. Well, here are your mindset shifts. First of all, it's extremely helpful to have a compelling reason why and to assess really your readiness to change. Like I shared with you earlier, I had a compelling reason to change because my daughter was 12, I was in the peak of my career and I wanted to be there for her. I wanted to rate, finish raising her and to send her to, to college. That for me was enough for, for me to let go of, you know, of my junk food and to make a change. But I know not everyone is ready and at that point. So the information that I'm sharing with you today is something to tuck away and keep in the back of your mind until you are ready. Number two is to eat mindfully. Mindfulness is actually a form of meditation. And I know that we tend to think of mindfulness with related to breathing, but mindfulness is also key for healthy eating. And that refers to getting rid of all distractions, the telephone, the, the, you know, the cell phone, the TV, the laptop, and certainly you know, eating while driving. These are all distractions that, that can impair our ability to really gauge when we've had enough to eat because we're not focusing on the eating, we're just eating mindlessly. Eating in a dark movie theater is a classic example where at the end of the movie, you can be shocked that how much you've eaten because you don't even remember it happening. So we wanna do away with mindless eating. And another strategy is to slow down. When we slow down and we chew our food and enjoy 
to savor every bite. The experience is enjoyable, more satisfying, and it gives our brain time to register that it's full. It can take about 20 minutes for the brain to actually catch up to the, feel, to the feeling of fullness and to shut off the hunger. So we, we want to not rush through our meals. When I was in med school on surgery rotation, my first day as a medical student on my surgery rotation, the junior resident took me to the cafeteria and taught me how to eat a cheeseburger and fries in three minutes or less. And he said, as we went through the, to the, through the line, don't eat the salad and don't eat the vegetables because they take too long to chew. And at the time, it kind of made sense what we were doing because we knew the nurse was going to page us to go to the ER and we might be holding retractors for six hours. So we, we felt compelled to try to learn to eat lunch for three in three minutes. But now we know <laughs> that doesn't help you for long. You're going to pay for it in the end. And I also encourage with your mindset shifts to not do this alone to find a support, supportive person, a supportive group or community that's all moving in the same direction so that you, you actually, um, it's easier. It's easier than being alone. The next category of strategies is to have yourself a strategy for satisfying snacks when you need them. First of all, the truth is that when you think about eating or snacking on something, you might not always be hungry. Sometimes thirst is masquerading as hunger. It's a good idea to first just make sure you're well hydrated. Drink some water. Let's settle in. That might be all you need. The next thing, number two here on this list, is to avoid trying to eat everything in moderation. So seriously, this one is one you really want to pay attention to because the concept of eating everything in moderation has led many people astray. Eating in moderation takes a tremendous amount of willpower, and it's only a matter of time before the system breaks down and you, you, you binge on that thing that you've been trying to avoid. It's just like when I was explaining to you the pleasure trap of moving between those phases. You never can get through that valley of phase four when you keep sliding back to having little bits of junk food. And it's so difficult to eat one potato chip. It is so hard to have one little square of chocolate and stop. So the best thing to do is to get it out of your system. In order to do that, we're on point number three here is let's get the junk food out of our house, get it out of sight. So it's out of mind. You'd be surprised at how much easier it is to focus on other things when you don't see that in your environment. This is a problem in workplaces. If in your workplace, there's a bowl of candy out on the main desk, or like it was for me in my, in the anesthesia office, we had a platter of chocolate chip cookies that was out. We had actually two platters of cookies that were out from 7 a.m. And it was in our contract for the hospital to replace those cookies on demand. <laughs> so they were always in sight and between cases, we were eating them like they were going out of style. Also, I would recommend preparing some whole food plant-based snacks in advance. Instead of having cookies out, have a bowl of strawberries out. Wouldn't that be nice? Something that you can grab easily and conveniently that's going to be good for you and, and won't trigger a craving. The next thing is meal and snack planning mastery. This is more along the lines of preparing your meals in advance, cooking on the weekend, planning that, that grocery shopping list with those recipes in mind, and then you're in control. There aren't any surprises. You're taking away the guesswork. We wanna focus on our plant-based nutrition, which will give us high fiber foods that are naturally low in fat, that keep our stomach full, and we feel satisfied at the end of a meal. The diversity of plants is key. 
because then we're getting that wide range of nutrients that we need for a healthy gut microbiome. And that also is linked to being able to curb our appetite between meals and, and eliminate cravings. And don't let yourself get too hungry. I know, I know it's really popular out there now to do fasting and all of these things, but what we want to do is stay more in, in our net, in a more, in a more normal routine and not allow ourselves to get hungry by waiting to the end of the day to eat. And certainly don't grocery shop when you're hungry. That'll get you every single time. For lifestyle refreshers, I have four points here for you. Number one is to get proper sleep because sleep deprivation is associated with problems with junk food cravings. Consuming more calories is linked to just staying up later at night. And it can happen very quickly. Just one or two nights of staying up can actually really ruin you in terms of your appetite. So, but for adults around seven to nine hours is, is a typical range. And we, we want to be able to do away with our sleep deprived society. Engaging in regular physical activity is really a must as well. That's one of the ways that we can also decrease our, our cravings. Let's address boredom as well, because boredom actually plays a role for some people in why they're eating. Instead of eating because we're bored, we need some stimulating activities that are, are healthy and, and keep us um, you know, moving forward. And of course, managing stress. Stress is a very important factor and can actually unmask some of the cravings that have been suppressed. Under periods of very high stress, you may be more at risk to going back to some unhealthy habits. And if necessary, a mental health professional can be very helpful. What I'd like to suggest is that you choose an action step that's right for you. One action step at a time may be the best way to go. For many people, it is. So pick one action step that you know that you can commit to and be consistent with. And of course, give yourself patience and give yourself grace. Here are some references for you. And these slides are available at the end. I'll have a link for you so you can, can check them out. So here's the recap. We talked about our human nature and how human beings prefer high calorie options. We're going to go for the highest calorie option in our environment. And that's one of the key reasons why we want to clean up our environment, right? We also talked about the pleasure trap. In the pleasure trap, what feels good for you is bad. And what feels bad is good, right? So the healthy foods don't seem to be as good as eating junk. But what we can do is we can flip this back around so that we regain that normalcy through whole food, plant-based nutrition. Those whole plant-based foods allow us to get out of the pleasure trap and reset our taste buds so that the natural foods begin to taste good, normal again. And I gave you four types of strategies right here through mindset shifts, satisfying snacks, your meal and snack planning, and your lifestyle refreshers. Here is my contact information. And here below here is a bit.ly link. If you would like to download the slides, you can do that. You can take them now. It's right there, bit.ly forward slash food cravings PDF. Wow. Thank you so much. What, awesome. a, what a wonderful presentation. Thank oh, you. That's just terrific. And by the way, for people who are watching, uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and we'll send everybody a link in a few days so that you can uh, watch the uh, lecture again or you can share it with your friends or anybody you like. So um, uh, also, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And gosh, um, I feel like I want to go first here, Susan. I'm sorry. But I'm, <laughs> That's I'm, okay. I, I, I know. I, I think people are going to have a lot of questions as yeah. if there's already 
some good ones coming in. So okay, yeah, all right, take it away. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't really so much a question. I'm just so excited that you used the pleasure trap. Um, I just think that's such a wonderful graphic from that book, uh, and it really helps to ex uh, explain people to people. And also, I think it really helps to inspire people with, you know, why it is they they feel like they're stuck. So yeah, yeah actually, that kind of leads into that first question. Susan, did you want to read that first question or? So um, yeah, I, I think you've um, you've answered the first part of it, but um, it was if there is dopamine depletion due to food, sex, or other addictions, uh, what foods under the pl plant-based umbrella make most sense to rebalance this, and um, how long does it take uh, for the neurotransmitters to kind of rebalance once once you've made a shift in in what you eat? That's really great. Well, the foods, when we talk about whole food, plant-based nutrition, the key categories that we want to, to have a full balance of nutrients are we're talking about leafy greens, colorful vegetables, colorful fruits, whole grains, starches like sweet potatoes, and then of course, legumes, beans, lentils, peas. So that is that kind of gives you a picture of a balanced whole food, plant-based nutrition meal. And, um, so those are the types of foods and they're high in fiber. They are chock full of nutrients and full of even water. Therefore it's easy to feel easier to feel satisfied because they really do fill you up on very few calories. And, um, you asked how long the process takes, how long to get like through the pleasure trap when you decide you're going to do it. Well, that actually is going to vary from person to person. It might take somebody a couple of weeks. It might take someone a couple of months. So each person is going to be a little unique. It's not going to take years. So this is very different than an addiction to drugs. And so if someone is addicted to heroin, let's say, that could take a lifetime, really. I mean, it could take years to, to, to be able to not have the urges and cravings. This is not like that at all. This is really relatively short compared to something, you know, those other types of addiction. So that's the good news. Mm -hmm. Just to follow on to that. So we're talking about uh, uh, phase four in the pleasure trap, right? Yeah. Uh, and so you're saying that if you're stuck there because of food, it can, you can get out of there more quickly than if you're stuck there because, because of drugs or alcohol, I guess. So yeah. that, that whole, the whole sense of feeling normal. That's right. The alcohol, alcohol and street and street drugs that is a much more difficult, it's a much more difficult process. And mm -hmm. it can take literally like years for those cravings. So this is, when you think, when you compare to that, this is pretty quick, actually. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Exciting. So um, someone asked, how soon can I overcome addictions? I guess to addictions to cheese, meats, and sugars, which ones soonest and which ones are typically the most difficult to overcome? Well, Cheese is a big one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There is more of that. You actually have, um, you actually have the, the response to it is extremely, extremely pleasurable. It's, it's, it's a true comfort food that people, when people refer to something as a comfort food, and um, this is something that's so concentrated as well. And the food industry is, is focusing on that. That's why more and more cheese is, has been added to products over the past few decades. Mm. Sugar as well is, of course, as we know, mm. chocolate. But there are certain categories like chips. Chips are highly addictive at cookies and all of these processed grains. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely those are are. are top foods for, for the addiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Susan, what's next? Uh, next one. Um, can you talk a little bit about what happens when our taste buds shift? Uh, and is it different in men and women, young children, older adults? Um, is, is there, is there a difference? I don't know if there's a difference between men and women or older adults. But I do know that it is um, when, when our taste buds shift, you actually are taking nerve endings that have been dormant or overstimulated and desensitized and just allowing them to become, to function normally again. 
we are not designed to be able to handle a lot of overstimulation. So because certain foods were overstimulating, like incredibly sweet or incredibly salty foods or ice cream, for instance, that's beyond the level of pleasure that, we're, that we normally experience, that firing is going, the reaction is to let's tamp down this overstimulation just by desensitizing those nerve endings. So they aren't dead on the tongue and the brain, but it's just that um, it's a protective mechanism to shut things down a little bit. And once we stop having these highly stimulating foods, we regain the sensitivity. Smokers also, when they stop smoking, they can suddenly they can taste again. And um, so, so the, the, the taste buds do, they still have life. <laughs> Yeah, great. Wow, the Q&A section is lighting up here. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Hightower, I'm, now I'm just quoting someone here. This was <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, exclamation point. My question, I eat a healthy whole food plant-based lifestyle. If I go off that one time and have a junk food, what can I do or say to myself to get back on track? Oh, well, it's, I love this question. Well, first of all, give yourself grace. That's the main thing is to know you're amazing. You're doing a great job. What you, what you have done so far, hats off to you. And yes, you're human. So just decide to yourself, say to yourself, I'm an amazing person. Don't, 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 don't be down. Don't get down on yourself. Tomorrow's a new day. When the sun comes up, we just start over. That's really <laughs> what I suggest. Um, mm -hmm. And it, oftentimes what's hard is for people who are high achievers and you sound like a high achiever high achieving people want to be excellent and feel down on themselves when they're not perfect. And so sometimes they'll decide to do not to, to just say, well, forget about it. If I can't be perfect, I'm not going to do it at all. And, the, and the, they go really deep into the junk food for like maybe another months or years because, mm -hmm. because they feel so down on themselves. So give yourself grace. You're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, Dr. Friedman, what's next? next? Next question. How do you recommend dealing with excess, excess gas when you consume a whole food plant-based diet? I can't wait to hear your answer on this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There are certain foods where it helps to go slowly with if you're not used to eating them. Some people who, who are not used to eating beans, for instance, need to take it a little slow, a couple tablespoons, make sure those are tolerated and then just build up from there. I noticed that sometimes um, people aren't, aren't used to eating greens with a lot of fiber and they have to take it a little bit slow. And when you do, your gut microbiome has a chance to, to evolve and change and adapt to the, that new quantity of fiber that you're introducing and these new nutrients. And as you shift, then generally after two or three weeks, the gut is able to handle fiber better and the gas will dissipate and beans can be soaked. And sometimes I, I've found that lentils are easier to start with because they don't seem to produce as much gas, but it is a matter of, of taking it slow and um, giving yourself time and knowing that usually the, the transition works out pretty well for most people. There are only a few things that now I'm at the point where there are only a couple things that even after 13 years of being plant-based still give me a little bit of upset like that. And it's, I've noticed this is me personally. So this is not true for everybody. You kind of have to find your own little answer. But if I eat raw collard greens, as many times as I've tried, I can <laughs> get them to, I can't get them down, but, but, um, but I can eat cooked collard greens just fine. And so all the other greens and everything, I just got like a couple of things that <laughs> don't quite yeah. sit with me. Sure. Well, just so everybody knows, it's just as healthy to eat your collard greens cooked. So <laughs> however you can get them down there is great with us. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. So actually, uh, Dr. Hightower, Michael would like to know if you could talk about the satiations slash craving differences between eating low fat, medium fat, high fat versus low protein, medium protein, high protein versus low carb, medium carb, high carb meals, and the mix and match of these in a meal. So in other words, does it really matter what the, the uh, macronutrient 
profile is of the food you're eating. Yes, actually it does. Most importantly, when, when we are in, well, when we're in the junk, let's talk about junk food first. Junk food, the sugar, oil, and salt combination is, is really, it's horrible. And these foods are very small in the volume. You're getting a lot of calories in a very small volume because they're calorie dense and it's hard to be satiated, not only because of the euphoria sensation, but, but those, those categories. Now, in terms of, of the whole food plant-based, we, we don't want to, we need a balance. So I would say if you are, if you eat a very limited type of diet, you're actually going to be deficient in some nutrients. And so um, that's going to be problematic, but to get a wide range of plants in your diet means you're getting that broad diversity of nutrients and um, your brain is monitoring your, the nutrients in your body. And so when we get deficient in some areas, it, it's going to actually you know, be problematic and you won't be, you won't, you won't feel good. You won't have the comfort of, of nutrition and being satisfied. So I don't think it needs to be as complicated. That was a complicated question. And I think that probably if you have a balance there, you are going to be getting enough protein and you are going to be getting enough. Um, you don't need a lot of fat in the diet. It's just part of the vegetables that we eat. Um, and then we get a lot of carbs as well with this. So I don't know if I really answered the question quite well, but I, I would think, say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's a good answer. If I could just um, add to that a little bit, which is that I, you know, there's all these different formulas that you'll hear about, you know, 10, 10, 80, 20, 20, 60, meaning, you know, protein, fat, carbohydrate. I don't think that really matters, which is kind of what you're implying. What's more important is the ratio of junk food to whole food and which you want as little junk food as possible and animal food to plant food, which is what you want as little animal food as possible. So if you're going to think about ratios, which probably don't matter that much anyway, well, they matter in that particular situation. Uh, and I think you've gotten that message from Dr. Hightower today, which is that you really don't want any animal products in your diet and you don't want any junk food in your diet. So think of those, instead of trying to come up with the perfect ratio of protein, fat, and carbohydrate, just think of it in terms of protein of uh, the uh, ratio of good food to not good food, basically junk food to healthy food. That's so, right. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Friedman, what's the next question? Next one, Kimberly says, we've been rocking the whole food plant-based low fat lifestyle with our family. Our kids are seven and 11. My question is we would like to occasionally have he a healthier dessert. Would it be better to have a little bit once a day or once a week? We wanted to show our kids that treats come around from time to time so there's no forbidden food suggestions. And I think I, you said you wanted to have a little bit of a healthier treat, but it sounded like really you were talking about having like something a little unhealthy. I'm not quite clear on that word when you said had a healthier treat, but let's say that you are, I think you're talking about having a little bit of like, say, ice cream, like traditional ice cream, or maybe something like that from time to time. Well, my suggestion actually is to have a healthy version as opposed to an unhealthy version of it. And there are, we can have, we can use frozen fruit and get, and really get at a pretty incredible flavor without having to resort to real sugar, oil, you know, or anything like that, or dairy you can make nice cream, we call it nice cream, but the frozen banana, you could put a little cocoa powder in it unsweetened and just like let the fruit because mm -hmm. you'll find that kids are really in that stage, pretty flexible. They have, they have everything going for them. And if we just keep giving them the healthy options, they usually go with the direction that the grownups can send them in. Mm -hmm. and so I would say, stick with the healthy versions of it. I've even made, I've even baked with some dates and cocoa and you would think it was a real brownie by the time we got through with it. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> stick with that if yeah. you can, I would yeah. say. Mm -hmm. And Kimberly, congratulations. It sounds like you're doing a great job raising your kids. 
if that's yeah. the hard if that's the hardest question you have for us uh i think you're doing pretty well <laughs> yeah yeah so um nancy says what can you suggest i eat oh, this is interesting what should i eat when i'm having an afternoon full of a uh, lull and needing a pick-me-up in the past i'd eat chocolate or carbs thank you nancy from california yes well the pick-me-up that's a great question because from mm -hmm. i can tell you from firsthand experience that the exhaustion and fatigue of when i was eating the junk food diet was just incredible and your energy is coming back i had insulin resistance so my energy now when i got rid of that is just amazing so that starts to take care of itself to have energy. But if you really wanted to have a pick-me-up, make sure you're hydrated. Sometimes being dehydrated is the thing that makes people feel tired. And food that is nutrient dense is what you want. An orange might be your pick-me-up. Mm -hmm. a, a salad with greens and um, peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes. All of these foods actually are energy boosters. I don't think that you have to look for one particular thing, but, but I have found personally that I can pick myself up by making sure I'm hydrated, having a piece of fruit is, off, is often just all that I need. And generally by having a whole food plant-based diet, fatigue can be a thing of the past. If you find that you are persistently fatigued for some reason, make sure you're getting enough sleep, um, that you're getting good exercise and that you kind of have that healthy lifestyle and um, can go for there. But we don't, we don't need coffee really for a pick-me-up in this plan. Great answer. Uh, can you just uh, you use the term nutrient dense? Could you just define that? nutrient dense so that the vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants are still in the, in the product. They haven't been stripped out and discarded. So a whole plant-based food is intact the way it comes out of the ground mm -hmm. versus if you take a potato and you shrivel it up and put it in some processing plant and it can sit on your shelf for a year in a bag, that's, that's a processed food that's, it's really depleted of nutrients. It's not gonna spoil, it's got preservatives and it's really not nutritious at all anymore. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Dr. Friedman, what's next? Um, are there services or organizations or other supports available to treat sugar addiction? Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that when there is a true, there are levels of addiction um, and there are experts in, in psychiatry and psychology for, for things that fall into, um, for, and if it's a mental illness, a psychiatric condition, then there are experts in that because there are some cases that fall in, in that category. But what we really focus on right now is, um, is the impact of, of food that's just hijacking our natural instincts, our natural design. So you're here, really, in here in Rochester, you have your Rochester lifestyle medicine. Um, I would say those are the, the institutes that you can definitely mm -hmm. go to. And certainly, if you feel like you have um, something that doesn't seem to be re just responding, Make, you know, make sure that you are speaking to your to your one on one doctor if you feel like you need to go to a higher mm -hmm. level of care. Well, Dr. Hightower, thank you so much for that plug for our, what we do here. These people are these people are not just from Rochester because we have uh, viewers from all over the country, fortunately. But also, we're available all over the country. So uh, I'd like to make a little shameless plug for our 15 day whole food plant based jumpstart. So Becca, if you're interested, that is a really wonderful way to. Uh, to get those addictions under control. And, uh, you know, we tell people, look, you're a grown up, you can do anything for two weeks and just stick with it. Uh, we're there to support you. And uh, we run these jump starts every month. If you go to our website, rochesterlifestylemedicine.org, you can uh, find our calendar and sign up for the next, the next jump start. So um, this is really wonderful. It looks like we're going over time a little bit. Is that okay, Dr. Hightower? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. Dr. Friedman. Oh, I guess you just asked the last one. I guess. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go for more. <laughs> okay. Um, 
the question I've heard some people say not to go off a certain food or food group cold turkey in order to prevent a rebound effect neurologically or physically. But there are speakers I've heard that have advocated burning the boat, so to speak, and making the healthier food choices without looking back. What are your thoughts on that? I am definitely a proponent of burning the boat because this is, this is different than, this is not like withdrawing from heroin, right? It's not like withdrawing from alcohol, which can be detrimental for some people in that case, where if they try to just go cold turkey, they can have a life-threatening reaction in withdrawal. And here, what I have found is that gradually decreasing is very difficult because you have to be using your willpower the whole time. And if you, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's that you, it takes a longer time to go through the pleasure trap when you do it in those little increments. Like instead of having eight cookies a day, I'm going to just have six. Well, and then I'll do that for a while and then I'll just have four and then I'll have two. It's really difficult because me, I know, I'm just gonna just go ahead and eat the whole box. So what I would say is it works out to be more challenging, let's say, when we are in the moderation phase of trying to eat a little bit of moderation. It's actually more of a struggle because you've, you're employing willpower at maximum and that there's just a limit to that. So we're going to go uh, till 8.05. So we have two more minutes. Um, this is from Dr. Scott McRae. How about some suggestions for the 4 p.m. snacks at work? Are there any good natural food bars? So what about that 4 p.m. snack? Mm, the 4 p.m. snack, snack, definitely plan ahead. If you, when you're at work, it's great to have brought your, it's great to have, don't depend on what's at work for your snacks because that will leave you vulnerable. It's good to come ahead with something quick and easy. Mm -hmm. Apples, clementines, strawberries are great. Some, and if you need to, you could have, I like to have a little wrap. I've done veggie wraps. They're small, mm -hmm. they're easy. You can eat them with um, you know, veggies in there, a little hummus, something that's, that's quick, but that is also very satisfying and won't trigger a craving. Those are the kinds of things I think are great. It's great to think that way when you travel and when you're at work, things that go well on an airplane. So, so it's great to practice with that. What satisfies you without having to, to resort to depending on what might be laying out in the break room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, hydration is important with water. So that question included, are there any good natural food bars? Oh, yes. Are there any good natural food bars? I actually have found a brand, Lara, Lara mm -hmm. bars that are very simple, not, not the whole brand, but there are many of their flavors that are, are simplified with, with right. dates. Um, they're mostly made with, with dates, no added sugar. I think mm -hmm. a few might have sugar, but, mo but most of their bars don't. So I, I like that brand personally. That's a great answer. Okay, Dr. Friedman, we have one time for one more question. Okay, for those who really have a sweet tooth, what is your opinion on coconut sugar and other plant-based sugars for making meals? And what are your thoughts on incorporating stevia, agave, and monk fruit drops in addition to fruits in the diet? Mm. Well, unfortunately, the food industry has shifted toward making certain things sound like they're healthier than, than they really are. And that's what's happening with these alter with these sh sh natural sounding sugars. There are, but in our body, they're still processed. We're still getting a highly refined product, even though it comes from a plant. So don't be fooled by the terminology of natural. You'll see this is a natural sugar. It's brown sugar. It's um, it's still can in your body quickly absorbed. It's highly refined and keeps that craving for sugar more likely because your taste, but they're so sweet, some of these um, products. I don't, I don't think that that's the best way to go. Even stevia, I know that many people are looking towards stevia, but because it's a highly concentrated and processed product, although it originated from a plant, it's, it's, not, it's not that great. And also it can affect 
stevia in particular can affect your gut microbiome in a negative adverse way. So therefore for that sweet tooth, when you have a sweet tooth, think about things that are naturally sweet. It's amazing how delicious fresh blueberries are in a smoothie um, mm -hmm. or this time of year, especially strawberries. And when you want something that's a little more sweet, like a treat, you can take a date. I take a date and dice it up, sprinkle it over what I'm eating. If it's like oatmeal, I want it fancy. I've even added a date to my nice cream with my frozen banana, a ripe frozen banana with a little bit of plant-based milk and a date and a cup, like four strawberries. It's like, Oh, it is amazing. It's just like the strawberry ice cream that my parents would buy. I mm -hmm. thought, oh, I'm, it's amazing what you can do with, with the fresh stuff. So, so give it a try. Don't give up on it and try to not resort to those other unhealthy sweeteners. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Well, listen, Dr. Hightower, we are so grateful that you were able to join us this evening. And we are going to have to have you come back because we have so many unanswered questions here. <laughs> yes, just answer the questions. <laughs> I think we can skip the presentation next time and go right to the questions. So anyways, uh, any last thoughts from Dr. Hightower? Uh, parting oh, thoughts for our yeah. audience? Yes, I really, well, I, first of all, I want to thank you for your wonderful attention and amazing questions. You've just been in a, gr a great audience. I want to encourage you to really put yourself first and know that you're on the right track. You really definitely, you are on the right track. Give yourself the patience, the love, the self-care that you need to, to give it a try. And you'll see the difference and be so grateful that you did. Well, thank you for that. So Dr. Friedman, thank you so much. Oh, uh, for um, thank you. <laughs> for thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me. It was a real pleasure. And, and, and thank you to, uh, uh, Bob Frankie, who's uh, behind the scenes engineering this whole uh, blessed event. And um, thank you uh, on the audience for coming. So uh, we're just keep an eye on our, uh, our website. We'll be announcing the next uh, lecture in this series of, uh, after the summer's over. So we're gonna take a little break for the summer, but we've got some exciting lectures coming up in the fall. So uh, everybody have a wonderful evening and see you all soon. Thanks for Good, night. Good night. Good night. Good night.